Well, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, we're really excited to share this with you. Um, and we've got a really great panel for you tonight. Uh, so without further ado, I'll introduce you to uh, Damon Gamo, who is our panelist, um, and he's author and filmmaker. Thanks, Damon. Thank you, David. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's lovely that you could join me in my home tonight. I really appreciate it. Uh, people underestimate the lucrative nature of the Australian documentary film industry. Um, but here it is. Um, I would just like to start by acknowledging uh, the lands that we're gathered on today, uh, the lands of the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation, and I just pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, and also I think acknowledge the extraordinary knowledge systems that they have embedded right across our landscape and in our waterways. And that 70,000 years of acute observation of science is something that we should be incorporating right now into our own Western thinking. There is a beautiful collaboration on offer and we need it, as many of you will be aware. So before I introduce uh, a pretty spectacular panel for you, I just want to give some brief context as to why we're here and why the oceans really need our help. I think some of you will be familiar with it already, but I just want to give a brief overview. Our oceans are suffering some of the worst damage of our human activities. Uh, they absorb more than 90% of the excess heat that we're generating through climate change. In fact, it's the equivalent of putting five atomic bombs into the ocean every second. That's how much heat we're putting into the oceans. And that excess heat is causing migration of species. It's wiped out seagrasses and kelp forests. In fact, we've lost 140,000 hectares of kelp forests in Australia in the last two decades. Uh, that warm water is also expanding, which is causing sea level rise. And as we've seen recently, it's the bleaching. We've had our fourth bleaching event in seven years on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, and in a La Nina year, which is extraordinary, it's the first time that's ever happened. Uh, then there's acidification. The oceans are now 30% more acidic than they were pre-industrial revolution. Uh, there's plastics, there's overfishing. I could go on, but we'd all end up in a fetal position and drink skull bottles of champagne for the rest of the night. So let's get to the solutions, which is why we're here, and we have a really extraordinary panel. So I'd like to welcome back to the stage uh, Xavier Moore, who is the CEO of Advanced Navigation, and the reason we're all here, please make you welcome. <laughs> Michaela Dominus is here as well, and she is the research uh, and development at the uh, Mindaroo Philanthropic Foundation. You can see here, Constructive Management. <laughs> Justin Gillard, who is a, um, a PhD at the University of Western Australia, their Oceans Institute. Please make him welcome. Vergez, who is a professor at UNSW of Marine Ecology. Please make her welcome. And to do a lovely uh, synchronised swimming performance is Andy Wrigley for us here. And he's the founder of the Citizens of the Great Barrier Reef and also the founder of Earth Hour. So please make them all very welcome. So Andy, I'm going to start with you. And uh, I think we're hearing, I guess there's a lot of awareness in society around protecting our land ecosystems and like national parks and forests and whatnot. Where are we at in terms of ocean and marine ecosystem protection and, and what do we need to do moving forward? So I think, um, you know, there's these two things going on at the moment. You've got, as you said, uh, the, the massive need to reduce emissions for, for climate change, but uh, not just on the land, but also in our oceans, there's this incredible need to scale up conservation. And I think that's kind of where we are, where we are not just with this kind of technology side, but with people, with awareness of what's going on. Most people know that the reef has bleached in the last uh, few weeks, but they don't really know what it means, maybe. They don't know how uh, unusual that is uh, in, in a near year. Um, so, yeah, look, I mean, I think um, the oceans is kind of sometimes forgotten, but incredibly important. And we're starting to see, are there sort of organisations looking at protecting particular parts of the ocean now and, and making them sort of marine zones where you can't fish? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's, there, there is, there is, but there's not anywhere near enough. And um, I think, you know, we take our most famous place, uh, uh, or probably the most iconic place on the planet in the oceans, which is Great Barrier Reef. And even though it is in the headlines, you know, we had a budget yesterday and still nothing on, on, on solutions around that stuff. So. Look, we're, we're scratching the surface, so there needs to be a massive drive, not just on emissions reduction, but on scale up of engagement in conservation in oceans, and everywhere, actually. Yeah, uh, Michaela, I want to ask you, actually, the, 
there is this growing awareness on, on land of um, this idea of carbon credits and biodiversity credits that might provide an extra income for our farmers and land managers as a way of valuing the ecosystems more that we have. Can you maybe talk about the potential of that in the ocean, this idea of the blue economy which is emerging? Maybe just the people that might not be really familiar with that. Can you just explain the blue economy and what the, the potentials of it are? Sure. So, um, the blue economy, which is very, in a very traditional sense, is, you know, protect Australia from... Whoops. Sorry. If we take Australia, for example, um, in 1718 we had $82 billion coming into the economy uh, from, from, from the ocean. And that was essentially in natural gas and oil production, followed by tourism. Uh, but that sense of what you know, the blue economy means is now really transitioning into thinking about the oceans as being a finite resource that we really have to protect. So when we're talking about the blue economy, it parallels with the way we are approaching the green economy, which is, you know, not only do we want some sort of economic return, but we also want to make sure that this, that, that how we are managing these oceans is sustainable, and there is also some sort of social benefit um, coming out of, uh, out of our economic yields. An example in the carbon side is, uh, is blue carbon. So most of the, of the world's carbon is, in fact, locked away in our oceans. Just recently in Australia, we've introduced blue carbon into our ACU system, our Australian carbon trading system. Um, it has some, I guess it's really, really early days. There's, there's a bit of, there's a few issues around land tenure because uh, the kinds of carbon that we're tar targeting in mangroves, seagrass and salt marsh is typically on crown land. Uh, it doesn't have the same price point as traditional carbon methods like tree planting, uh, but it's, it's, it's making a start. It's got a lot more traction internationally, so we see in particularly the mangrove space, it's really, really exciting. There you can actually get blue carbon from mangroves, which typically store carbon for long time periods uh, in their roots. Um, you know, if you, if you restrict tidal in inundation and uh, mangroves come back, you can then trade those carbon into voluntary carbon markets, which has been really successful, and then play all that um, uh, the revenue from that back into the local economy uh, for, for, for those who really need it. So really interesting times. Mm. Yes, as you mentioned mangroves there, and you think about how much we talk about preserving forests to maintain that carbon on, on these terrestrial, but the mangroves can hold up to four times more carbon than some of our land forests, can't they? They're, they're really important ecosystems. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Adriana, I might get to you on this because I know this is really your wheelhouse. You look at sea grasses and kelts in particular. Can you maybe talk about, other than the immediate action of, of, of taking action on climate change and lowering our emissions, what are the other potential solutions around regeneration of marine ecosystems and these things we hear too little about and, and the potency of sea grasses and kelp and all the benefits they could provide? Yeah, yeah, so this is, yeah, what we call kind of nature-based solutions and they would include kind of protecting what we have restoring um, ecosystems, and also uh, managing them in a sustainable way, right? And, and globally, nature-based solutions like this can account for about a third of the emissions that we need to cut um, to meet the Paris emissions. So it's, it's a meaningful kind of amount. Um, in, in my work, we, we work on restoring seagrass meadows and, and kelp forests that used to be here, but they have disappeared. And there's a carbon benefit to restoring these ecosystems, but there's also a whole lot of co-benefits in terms of biodiversity, in terms of in terms of human well-being when 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 these habitats are restored, in terms of coastal protection from erosion, etc. So so there's a lot more benefits than than just the, the blue carbon, which is what everybody kind of keeps being excited about, but it is it's not the only thing. Yeah. I remember even reading about, again, we hear about the, the sequestering ability of our soils on land and how much they can hold, but I remember reading about one of the oldest organisms in the world, which is a patch of seagrass in the Mediterranean. Right, yeah. I think it's more than 200,000 years old, and it sits on about 36 feet of soil yes. because it's been pulling carbon in for so long. This is the power that we have, isn't it, to mitigate the damage we're doing. Exactly, exactly. So that's why, yeah, seagrasses are such an important blue carbon ecosystem. But of course, you know, these habitats are you know, they're, they're out there and they're in a land that doesn't belong to anybody. So you know, on land, it's kind of easier to, to play the, the carbon credit kind of, you buy land, you grow trees, you can measure the carbon on the trees. Everything in the ocean is, is, is more complex, yeah. but the potential is also huge. 
Do you think we'll get to a point in the next few decades where we are seeing huge amounts of kelp grown for carbon markets, but also to restore and create habitats for marine life, or using the kelp for plastics and other materials? Is that kind of the multi-use of kelp? Is that starting to come through? Yeah, I mean, that's what a lot of people are, are, are talking about, and that's, that's not my field of expertise. I, I focus on restoring what was there, which is a lot, you know, like we've lost about a third of all our sea grasses, for example, right? So if we in were Australia to, or in globally, globally, a third. a third, yeah. So if we just focus on that, you know, that's going to keep us busy for a while. However, there is a lot of interest in growing additional seaweeds and then turning it into biochar or sinking it to the deep ocean where it can then yeah. become sequestered. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of excitement about that. Fantastic. Um, so, Justin, I know you do a lot of research in this area. Can you just talk about maybe some of the, the technologies that you've used now for this research and some of the limitations of those technologies up until now? Yeah, absolutely. So, our team at the University of Western Australia, we look at how waves and flows interact with different coral reefs. So, really looking at different coral shapes, but as well as how many corals are in a canopy and how that's impacted by the waves that come through during the cyclone. So, Really, we're looking at not only conservation, but also helping restoration of what specific shapes or how closely you should be putting these corals back in the water. And to measure these waves and flows, we use a lot of acoustic instruments, which I guess has been the large focus technology developments in field instruments. Um, but in order to characterise a reef or you know define a shape of a coral or how many corals there are in a canopy, you need to go down there with teams of divers, which is quite time intensive. So I'm really excited about using Hydrus later in the year for the first time and using this growing field of photogrammetry to rebuild digitally coral reefs underwater and we're able to get a lot more parameters out of that, that, that study. And, and that's an interesting point maybe to everyone is, is um, how much has public awareness or understanding all the complexities of the ocean had to do with not being able to measure them as accurately as we could be? And, and how transformative could that be if we did start to use these technologies to talk about it more and collect more data? Does anyone want to comment on that? Uh, sorry, the one thing I would say is like one of the seaweeds we're restoring, crazy, went missing in the 80s, and it wasn't until the late 2000s that we even realised it. And that's because people didn't know that it had been missing. You know, people are not spending enough time on the water looking, right? right. So, so, you know, any technology that allows us to bring to the surface what happens um, you know, beneath the waves is going to be incredibly important. Just have to absolutely echo that. Um, you know, out of sight, out of mind. So we had the world's worst marine wave, uh, marine heat wave on, on record globally in 2010, 2011 along the Western Australian coastline. That wiped out 40% of the sea grass which beds in Shark Bay is around releasing, you know, over that period, what we would release in carbon dioxide for the whole of Western Australia in a single event. We lost most of our temperate reef north of Perth. It's never, ever come back. Our fisheries were depleted. They also haven't recovered. Abalone fishing, for example, those stocks disappeared forever. Gone. They've never come back. But no one knows about this event. The world's worst marine heat wave. You know, that's equivalent to a bushfire, just, you know, raising the entire, uh, imagine, coastline. Um, you, you'd hear about that, but, you know, that happened, the world's worst, and, and, and no one's aware. So I think technologies where you can have that sort of visibility in the ocean are really, really, really important, just to show the scale and the magnitude of this problem, to bring it alive, mm. really, really important. Great, Xavier, can you maybe talk about some of the, I guess, the barriers to these type of technologies in the past, before IFRS, but what are some of the things that have blocked these type of things um, previously? Yeah, sure. I'd say at the moment, you know, there's a big, big problem with accessibility of ocean data, um, and really it, it circles around the fact that you know, you're in very hostile conditions. Uh, you're dealing with pressure that's 300 times that of the atmosphere here. Um, there's no GPS. There's no radio waves. Um, you know, there's no Wi-Fi or anything like that, um, and you also uh, you've also got very little light as soon as you go down past 15 metres. So you really need all the systems to deal with this, and the corrosion of salt typically occurs. Um, you know, and it is a huge challenge. So that's why these systems tend to be really large and you know really hard to operate. You know, you need specialist equipment and specialist operators. 
And that was really the, the motivation for the Hypress program. You know, make ocean data more accessible to everybody through, uh, you know, through advanced technology. Yeah. So it might be good just to get a sense of um, how you think you would all use this technology. I know, Andy, at the moment you're really active on the reef and doing lots of work. How do you think this technology could suit what you're doing? Well, I think when you come back to that thing of how do you create scale, yeah. you're, you're looking for a blend of ways of doing that. So that can be from you know the dive boat that's going out that can act as the way of getting something like that out there, that can collect it in, I think, say, able to go for a year, potentially, right? to uh, blending that with you know the person in the water with the GoPro, blending that with the very, very in-depth detail stuff that someone like the Australian Institute of Marine Science is doing in terms of research. So I think there is no, there's no silver bullet here, there's no single way of doing it, but actually what you're trying to find is a way of constantly increasing sea time, research time, and then being able to utilize that data. It's not just having that data if you don't do anything with it, it's being able to use that data to start to look at how can we be better stewards of the reef, given that we're getting ourselves into a situation where we need essentially, for example, coral lifeboats. We need you know, reefs that are gonna be protected and are gonna be able to be in, maybe restored just to um, you know, hopefully bridge the gap whilst humanity gets its act together, touch wood. Yeah. Mm. And Adriana, what about you in terms of tracking some of the sea grasses or area? Do you think this would be about value? Yeah. It's the equivalent yeah, of a drone on land. So the beauty of it is that you can get, with photogrammetry, you can get an actual map of the, of, of the whole area that you're sampling. You know, as marine scientists, we normally go and we take quadrants, and then those quadrants are representative of the population, and you know, it's okay. But obviously, if you can actually capture the whole thing, that's, that's revolutionary. You can measure the entire area, restore it, and you could even, yeah, get really high resolution on, you know, canopy height and a whole lot of variables. But, to do that by diving would be way too expensive, right? So, yeah. Can you just tell me, because I know you've got so many good stories about some of the more optimistic regeneration stories that you've come across lately in your work or you're seeing that are underway right now that are potentially going to make some really meaningful impact? Oh, um, we are seeing a bit of a, of, a, of a turn. For example, with seagrasses in Europe, up until 2010, there was continued declines and we have lost about a third. But since 2010 or so, we're actually, um, we're no longer seeing the decline. We're kind of on the way up. So the, the tide is turning. In the US, there's some incredibly successful restoration projects. And here, we are starting to restore species that up until, yeah, only five years ago, people thought that it was too difficult, right? So it is definitely, it is definitely possible. Um, and what about even, I know with our kelps, I know Tasmania lost, was it, 95% of their kelps? You were saying before that even some of the urchins that have come down, as they're getting removed, some of the kelp is starting to regrow, is it right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so in Tasmania, because um, Tasmania, the two biggest fisheries are rock lobster and abalone, they depend on the, on the kelp. So when the kelp disappears, those fisheries decline. So the fishers, they don't have any abalone to catch anymore. Uh, so the government kind of gave them an incentive to go and catch urchins instead. The urchins are what, what is eating the kelp. Or one of the things that is uh, leading to the disappearance of the kelp. So by removing the urchins, the kelp is regrowing back. And the thought is that you know, within five, ten years, hopefully we'll start getting our loni back as well. And in those urchin, is there the secondary markets there apart from eating? Is, is it all the, the mineral content of those urchins good for soil and things like that? That's right, yeah. yeah. So they're developing markets for the waste products so that the actual urchin test can be used as a fertilizer. It's really high in calcium. I must say that this is to restore the golden kelp, not the giant kelp, the one that has disappeared is the, is the 95%, is the giant kelp. This is the golden kelp, which is also disappearing because of these sea urchins, which are there because of climate change. So they weren't there six years ago, now the water's too warm. So yeah, it's, it's a complex problem. But, uh, but there are solutions that can benefit people as, you know, and economies as well as the environment. And Michaela, what about you in terms of using this technology with what you're doing at Mindaroo? Do you think there's some projects that align with it already? Yeah, so, so we support a lot of marine research and you know, this allows us to do, just collect data a lot faster and a lot cheaper. So the way you used to do it in the old days is either someone gets in the water um, and then you've got lots of you know, finite times because decompression limits for scuba divers, or you have really bulky, expensive equipment that requires dedicated pilots and vessels to, to sense. Send, um, to send the equipment out. 
So this essentially, you know, miniaturizes everything, but like mobile phones, the old bricks, you used to have to drag those things along, now you've got a tiny little mobile phone, makes it just so much faster, so much more mobile to collect data. But we also think it's going to open up a lot more areas. So the deep sea is really unknown at the stage. You know, if you could send something down, autonomous to go and collect information at the, at the deep and dark hail depths, which are really unknown, six kilometers and beyond. Um, we have a deep sea research lab at UWA uh, that's doing a lot of that work, and we hope to use something like this technology to find uh, a lot more of those unexplored areas. But we also really see the potential for um, a lot more data collection in, in, I guess, alternative ways. So citizen science programs, you know, once a price point is, is hit, just like drones, people can go out and collect information um, themselves and send it, send it to a, a research institute to, to contribute to that collective data. So that's a really exciting um, possibility as well. And then the last I'd say really is ocean literacy because you know you can put a camera down there, it's tiny uh, and it can stand up forever so you can get some fabulous shots um, and I think that will really help with some, um, some advocacy and, and ocean conservation as well once, once we have exposure you know, to just how wonderful it is uh, through the types of videos you can collect with something like this. Justin, do you want to add anything to that in terms of your research, how, how it might be the use? Yeah, I think, um, I think not only tracking how the reef's changing relative to the waves, but what we also do up in Exmouth in Western Australia is we scan the beach line using an aerial drone. And so now we can start mapping using similar techniques as the reef's degrading, how is that affecting the shoreline, which is also not only the shoreline, but more fragile ecosystems like your seagrasses that are sitting inside the, the fringing reef. So it's, it's really bringing a lot of different stories together onto the same page. We might take some questions. Does anyone have any questions for the panellists or any comments? We'd like to get in the pool and test the hydras themselves. <laughs> my, uh, my mind was sort of getting away with me a little bit on the boat before and thinking about this new era of people that are shipwreck hunters and looking for treasure. And then I also started to think about opportunistic fishing and targeting certain species. Like there's this bit of a, a wild west, you know, scenario playing out in my mind. And so I guess the question is around ethics and morals that could become associated with this new frontier of exploration of the ocean that any person with, you know, a few tens of thousands of dollars might be able to open up and, and come to some, not, not, not target at anyone in particular, but I don't know who wants to chime in and think about that, that scenario that could be happening in the future around this technology. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take this one. So I guess with every every technology, you know, there's there's negative sides, and you know that that's common with every kind of new technology. Um, but you know, as long as the goods out significantly outweigh the bads, you know, then it's a positive overall technology, and we can see this technology having a, a really big positive benefit um, in terms of critical like ocean health issues that we're currently facing. So the other actual, like, do you need a license for that? Are there any regulations, like taking a boat out and whatnot? Do you need a hydrous license to run one of these things? Or how does that work? No. So currently, there's no no regulation, no licensing um, for underwater vehicles. Yeah. Someone else have a question? Yeah. Was there a, an application that you particularly had in mind when you were designing? Um, so I guess like. We wanted to take the drone revolution that's happened with uh, aerial drones and made that happen underwater. And I guess, like, you know, we've seen all the amazing things that have happened with the aerial drone revolution. And it's like so much data is now captured by aerial drones and it's like making a huge positive impact to our lives, those drones. Um, you know, so we wanted the same thing to happen underwater. And one of the prime applications was, yeah, like, you know, ocean health. Um, and things like that. So, you know, being able to go down and gather that data, um, you know, being able to monitor things, um, having it in its residential dock and able to go out and every day, check the, like, check the health of the reef, come back, you know, being able to just automatically capture all that data, um, you know, that was our real goal. Um, 
Is that how far away are we from being able to have live streams of this in terms of, is, is that going to be a real challenge because of the depth of the water and the signal and whatnot, or are we going to reach a point where that might be possible? Uh, yeah, so actually um, you can get a live video feed, but you have to be um, only within about 15 metres. And it uses light, so radio waves can't travel through the water. So you actually use light to send the video data. Um, kind of like how you have fiber optic data connection, um, but beyond that, yeah, you, it needs to capture the data and come back and you grab it when it comes back. Good. Anybody else? How are you how are you capturing? Can you capture images once you get into dark water? Like how is the how are you actually capturing images? Is there a light source that you have to create? Yeah, so um, there's a very very powerful light source on the front of it. Um, if you have a look at the one in the tank, you'll see all these little clear windows, and that's um, really powerful LEDs. Um, and it's got like an AI adaptive lighting system, so it will adjust the lighting to be just the right amount um, for the shot it needs to take. Um, because you know, if you if you illuminate the water too much, all the particles in the water suddenly like just ruin your image. So you need to have the lighting just right, um, and then you can take you know really good footage on the water. Anyone else? Or I'll I can ask a few more. Yes. Product. How many years does it last? Uh, it's a good question. <laughs> Um, so I guess, you know, we, we would expect it, it should last, you know, upwards of 10 years. You would have to replace, um, the battery is serviceable, so the battery can be replaced. That would need to be replaced every five or six years, just like a mobile phone. Um, you would also need to sort of manage anti-fouling. Um, so you can use similar techniques that you use on, on boats and ships um, to manage biofouling um, attaching to the unit. Um, and as long as you're sort of doing that, um, yeah, you know, it, it should have a very long life. Have you tested it around animals or anything yet? Or any, yeah, what's the, do dolphins just want to play soccer with it and stuff? Like, have you... um, yeah, so actually we, we did a survey with Mindaroo up at the Nigaloo Reef um, with a couple of units. Um, so there's some really great footage from that. Um, yeah, there's some very inquisitive marine life. Um, and the interesting thing is you know, with the obstacle avoidance, it, if, a, if a fish is coming for it, it's going to try and get out of the way. So, you know, like, it will change, change course and the fish will follow. So it's kind of playing a <laughs> chase. Uh, a lot of the people that we work with on the reef won't wear white fins because uh, absolutely no data to prove this, but, but uh, the theory is that it attracts the sharks. Is that so? Yeah. They, they don't wear white fins. Oh, right. Is, yeah, because it uh, apparently attracts the sharks. No data to back that up. Right. Okay. Yeah, we, we, well, we can certainly uh, we can paint it any colour, and you know, <laughs> those shark repellents. Yeah. Yeah, we, we've got some anecdotal as well. I think we said don't paint it yellow because all the the types of equipment we have, if they're yellow, they come back with big fat sharks. That's what I heard. Two yeah. marks yeah. below yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yellow. <laughs> Any other questions? Just um, about the, the unit itself. Quite often with these new technologies, once they're launched, the community starts using them and asking for a whole bunch of new features to be included that they want to take advantage of. We've seen that across the board, the tech space, in a lot of different ways. Um, are you, how, how, does this product allow things like that? Is there an attachment opportunity for it? for example, so that when those requests start to come in, you can then take advantage of those uh, enhancement opportunities that people are asking for, potentially looking to pay extra money toward? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess we've built the system as an open platform, so you can actually load your own software on it and run your own software. Um, so say you want to do some specific uh, identification and then a, a a mission based on what the camera is identifying or the sonar is identifying. You can program that in the unit um, and so that's just fully open um, and anyone's able to do that. In terms of like extra equipment, there is a, um, there's a ring that can go on the back and it's like, it's like a payload ring 
Um, and so you can install your equipment in the payload ring um, and the system can carry it with it. The tracking a diver, so let's say you put a diving team or even a single cell dive, diver down, will it track that diver and follow it? A bit like what we said with drones, with personalised drones, is there a... Yeah, so, yeah, it, it can, um, you can do a diver following, um, you can program it to, yeah, identify um, a diver, a specific diver and follow them, um, so it can be your, like, video companion, um, you can also um, program it to try and, like, identify marine life and, uh, you know, take video footage of that particular marine life, um, so that's all done with the AI, it allows it to uh, do that identification uh, and then following. Okay, well I might um, just spring a final question on the panel uh, without notice, sorry to do this to you, but um, I just thought I'd ask, is there one thing from the work you all do that you would like the audience to understand or know? What's something that often gets miscommunicated or people don't understand about what you do that you think they need to know? Andy. Andy, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think the biggest I, the, I go back to scale. It is, is, you know, when you look at the Great Barrier Reef, for example, the, just the complete, um, it is so massive. The job ahead is so massive. The, the need to scale up is just, just incredibly urgent. And there is no silver bullet, as I said. It is a combination of the role of the individual, the company, the technology, the government, uh, it, is, it is a massive task ahead of us and there's no more years to wait and talking, it's the time for doing so. That's really the, I mean, it's a boring message to keep repeating, but that's the one. Um, I, I actually think that very often we, we don't hear enough about the good news stories, the things that we do manage to fix. And, and we have done some amazing things, like you know, in, in the particular case of the seaweed that I've restored here in Sydney, um, it was a pollution problem and deep ocean outflows were installed that the water quality, except when there's floods like right now, <laughs> in general, is really, really good. And that was a major engineering feat that happened and people don't know about it. They've forgotten, there's amnesia. But I think by actually um, kind of paying attention to things that do work, um, it, it can give us more, more, more hope and uh, you know, it can inspire people. And in terms of what needs to happen, I think it's a, it's a combination of, of, yeah, restoration and mitigation at the same time, together. And, and the mitigation needs to be, um, like, uh, very ambitious and very urgent. And at the same time, we work on the restoration. That's what's going to get us out of here, I think. Um, yeah, I think, I think the biggest thing in, in conservation and restoration is, is using that guided approach and bringing everyone together. Not, it's not just a question of just going out there and planting corals wherever. You know, it's about taking into consideration why we should be putting certain things in certain regions and what their ecosystem function is and how that's changed over the last five to ten years. You know, things are changing rapidly. Has that been documented? Because the reality is the environment five, ten years ago isn't the environment that it is now. So if you're trying to restore and conserve things that can't survive, then it's Time pouring down the drain. So, and I just want to—you you and I were talking before. I thought it was a really hopeful story too that you've noticed even in the last five or six years at the university that some of the research coming through is not so much around oil and gas exploration and those. It's actually now around restoration and regeneration and wind farms and those sort of technologies. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, there's definitely a noticeable shift in in applying the same knowledge but in different. Fields. So, you know, there's these mentioned earlier nature based solutions, you know, using our understanding of the natural environment to provide those ecosystem services mm. um, to the general population and then applying our understanding of anchors in, in, the, in the seabed to now offshore wind. So, there's, there's that really nice transition. Yeah. Michaela? Yeah, I'd say, um, I think often people are quite surprised that you know, we're, we're still maybe just grappling with climate change. We've had extraordinary increases in uh, planet temperatures for the last 50 years. They're accelerating rapidly. So, you know, we're in the hot seat, you know, we're right now. Right now we all have to act. Judging on the, on the, 
on the last budget, um, I'd say that, you know, don't wait for government. It's not gonna, it's not gonna happen. Don't wait for world leadership. It's gonna take absolutely everybody to make a difference. That means harnessing uh, the private sector, that means harnessing the public. Everybody has to be part of the solution. And, and there are starting to be ways in which everybody can be part of it. That's, that's the big difference. Yeah, it's opportunities. Yeah. And that's it, there's, there's, there's massive opportunities um, in that space. Xavier? Yeah. Having an awareness of these ocean issues that we're facing um, and how critical they really are right now um, you know, is, is really the thing that we want to get out there. Right. So please put your hands together for this excellent panel.